It was a cloudy day in July, and we saw these busting bait fish all over the place and fish moving. And and uh, we went over and we started fishing to them, and, and we caught them. And there were walleye doing this, and it was just I was just amazed at these fish doing this. So you can run into these feeding windows, and it's a lot like musky, where <laughs> there just happens to be this feeding window, and they seem to all just get hungry and go to town. And maybe it's an opportunistic thing for them, or maybe it's a cyclical thing or a timing thing or a lighting thing or a barometric pressure thing. That was Matt Snyder talking about busting bait fish, walleye style, checking off another species today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show today. If you get a chance, please support this podcast by going to wetflyswing.com slash members and joining the members group. Uh, this is part of the value for value model uh, noted by two guys that are uh, doing some great stuff. Uh, podcasting 2.0. I want to give a shout out to Adam Curry. If you're listening, Adam, we've got you covered. Fly fishing style here today. Matt Snyder is here to shed some light on fly fishing for walleye and other similar uh, warm water species today. We dig into the 10 big tips for warm water fishing, including an easy uh, strategy on reading structure uh, in the lake, the uh, best bait fish patterns to use, and why sonar is such a key for Matt. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Tokens Fly Shop, providing superior products at an affordable price. An amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Tokens has been over delivering on price, service, and passion. And now it's time to discover the Tokens buzz for yourself. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Tokens to get started today. You support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Tokens online. That's wetflyswing.com slash Tokens. T-O-G-E-N-S. Togans. Another passionate fish explorer. So without further ado, here is Matt Snyder. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. We uh, we connected. I believe the first time I connected with you was through that um, the clubhouse thing when Roger uh, Maves, right? Because I had connected with Roger I'm not sure um, exactly if that was the first time I heard about you, but we're going to dig into Fish Explorer and some warm water tips and tricks today. Uh, before we get there, talk about how we I always love to go back to the start, just kind of how you first got into fly fishing. How, how did this passion begin? Well, you know, I think like most of the listeners and most of the people you've interviewed, I was one of those kids that you just couldn't get off the water, whether I was catching fish or not. Um, fly fishing, I had a fly rod. I grew up in Northwest Ohio. And I had a fly rod that somebody gave me and it was, you know, a cheap something or other. And and I had a friend of my dad's teach me how to use it a little bit. And I'd catch panfish off a dock or whatever, but it wasn't that serious. It was when I was in college um, and we started getting, we moved into a house on a lake on the Finger Lakes in upstate New York. And there was a, a coal plant and there was water kicking out the cooling water kicking out of that and all winter long it was the hottest place in the area to fish landlocked salmon and big browns and rainbows and that's where i started like tossing zonkers out in this current and catching these landlocked salmon and then i started getting into the the river fly fishing in that area and by the time i graduated um we just a few friends uh, packed up in our cars and drove to jackson hole and that's where I really immersed myself and started working at the Orvis shop in, in Jackson Hole in 96, 95, and, um, and just really immersed myself into the, in, into the fly fishing and into uh, fly tying. There you go. And so, so, so it sounds like, yeah, fishing's been a lifelong and, and fly fishing's been a, a pretty close to that as well. And I love, you know, the Jackson Hole story. That's so cool because we talked kind of off air about some of the people, you know, Tom By and... Um, Laurie Ann Murphy, a lot of the, the Jackson Hole story. This is this has been going on since the beginning. I've been hearing little snippets of it. But what do you have a little story to share before we jump into it on Jackson Hole? Like like what what take us there? Any, any fun stories about that whole experience? Were you there a while? Well, I was there for one year. Yeah. Um, my wife moved to Cortez, Colorado, to be a wrangler, um, and well, as my future wife, um, 
she thought we were going to be close together because Wyoming and um, Colorado were so close together, but she, we were pretty much 12 hours apart, I think, at the time. Oh, wow. And uh, so I was out there with some friends, and we didn't have a place to stay or any jobs, and we just drove into Jackson Hole in June, and I think the first night it snowed. And um, next day we woke up, stayed at a friend's house and, and, and found a place to rent and started looking for jobs. That's when I found the Orvis job. I basically worked in the shop. I was experimenting with becoming a guide and I thought that's what I wanted to do. And after seeing those guys and, and how they work and stuff, I, I decided over that the course of that year that that's not really what I wanted to do. But I was there, yeah, um, in Jacksonville for a year and it was just too cold and, and we're not skiers. So yeah, uh, you mentioned Tom Bai was there. I didn't meet Tom till later. Um, he was driving a cab, I, I believe, at the time, and I'm sure he probably gave me a ride home at some point. They, <laughs> they offered free cabs at the time, so all you had to do is, wow. if you went to the bar and had some drinks, you just had to tell the bartender you needed a ride home, and they'd call a cab, and you'd get a ride home for free. So that was nice. Uh, yeah, um, Lorianne Murphy was there, and I, I'd met her there, um, and you had... Uh, uh, Perk Perkins on right recently. Yep. yep. Um, and I met him in the shop and then, uh, Gary Beebe was there as well. And, and actually, uh, Gary, that was right when you started the, uh, Chernobyl ant and he was tying it out of, um, kayak foam. Huh. And so I actually have, I just was going through my fly tying materials. I have some of that foam that he gave me. I'm not a kayaker either, so I don't like, I don't have any kayak right. foam. He gave me some of that foam while I was there, but we fished, you know, it's just not a place you can fish in the winter. So yeah. kind of wanted to get out of there. That's when we moved uh, to Fort Collins, but gotcha. all winter long, the river's frozen. There's not much to do uh, besides ski. For, I think for two weeks, it was below zero, never got above zero. And we're like, we just needed to get out of there. Wow. Wow. So so that makes sense. So when you move up to Fort Collins, now you get to a place where, I mean, obviously it can, it can get cold there too, but you have a lot of uh, warm water fishing. Talk, talk about that. Talk about some of the warm water. Is it quite a bit different than Jackson Hole? The warm water fishing, like still water fishing? Yeah, like opportunities. I, I'm not sure. I mean, what what is the big difference between Fort Collins, like if you just describe Fort Collins versus Jackson Hole? Why, why are they so different? Other than I guess one maybe costs a lot more to live at. Yeah, Jackson Hole is a mountain town. It's a you know ski town. It's trout, great, great fishing, uh, especially trout fishing in that area. When I was there, I didn't care about anything but trout. That's what I moved out here for. Fort Collins is on the um, eastern side of the Continental Divide, and it's um, you know right in the in the what we call the Front Range, where the the flatlands meet the mountains, and the weather is. Fairly warm and mild all year long. Right now, though, we're having a little heat wave, and it, I don't know. It, it, you're probably in one too, but it seems like it's happening all over the place. Fort Collins is nice. Colorado's got such a diverse uh, set of fisheries all over the state. I'm talking anything you can think about, like warm water, fresh water. Um, you know, people come here for the trout, but and the rest of the uh, fishing that they manage here is, is quite amazing all the little ponds all the lakes all the reservoirs and even some of the rivers a lot of warm water species yeah yeah that's right that is the cool thing about it because and we've done a lot of episodes with lots of people colorado is obviously a hot spot for fishing you know fly fishing but yeah you don't hear as much about at least you know from out uh, outside of it you don't hear as much about the warm water stuff but it makes sense i mean so and we're going to talk about that today some of the I mean, walleye is a good example, right? We, we, you know, walleye is a species I didn't even really realize was a popular fishery in Colorado. You got, you got all the bass and everything else that, that you've talked about. Um, but yeah, maybe we could just start there, Matt. We talked about this. We were kind of deciding, like, what, what do we want to focus on here? And I think what we'll do is keep it a little broad as we go and maybe talk generally about your strategies for warm water. But maybe start us off with walleye, just just to give us a species. I know I had somebody uh, out there in North Dakota uh, that said, hey, man, I, I just moved to North Dakota and I'm struggling. They, they only have walleye here. It's like, hey, give, me a, give me some walleye tips. So start us there. You fished a little bit for walleye. What, what should we know about getting started for that? I do fish for walleye. I'm, I'm a, a jack of all trades, master of none. So I'm not going to give you all the specific details about walleye and really nothing else. Maybe musky. Musky is probably my, you know, that's that's the one thing that I, I, I really have dug into over the years. But walleye on the fly is probably one of the one of the subjects that surprises most people. When I come off the water and, and they ask me, yeah, did I catch anything? And they think I'm fishing for trout because I'm using a fly rod. And I'll say, yeah, I got three walleye or whatever. And they just 
floored. Um, you know, especially conventional tackle fishermen just had no idea. In fact, uh, Fish Explorer really got its start when there was a, a writer named Ed Dentry um, who wrote for the Rocky Mountain News, which is one of those uh, newspapers that kind of went under as the newspaper um, issues were, um, you know, going through bad times. And uh, he ended up retiring, but he, I had contacted him um, about a record splake that was caught in Canada. And, and I said, well, I just caught one too here in Colorado. And I said, I've been, you know, I was out walleye fishing on the fly. And he said, really, do you think you can take me out and catch one? I said, sure. So he came up and it was November and we went out and we caught walleye on the fly. He said, that's the first time I've ever seen anybody say they could catch a walleye on the fly and actually do it. And so he wrote this great article and I've got it framed on my wall right behind me. Um, and that's where he talked a little bit about the website that we were starting. It was brand new. And then it just started really, the website started blowing up after that, but it was walleye that, that put that on the map. It was walleye. Oh, it was the walleye. There you go. What's the, um, is there a place we can find that article anywhere? Or is that just in magazine or what was Boy, that? I don't know if that's on there anymore. You'd have to come to my office and yeah. <laughs> look at it. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe I'll swing by at our, our road trip in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Let me see what it's called. It's, um, satisfying fling using this cast system and that kind of summarizes you know you want to talk about walleye or a specific species and i talked about basically it's more about my approach to warm water fly fishing that produces things like walleye or smallmouth or whatever i'm going after um it's the approach really that, that matters and, and walleye are that way too when i go out walleye fly fishing i'm not fishing for those fish that are the prototypical, what everybody thinks a walleye is, is a bottom hugging, lazy, fat fish. It just sits on the bottom. Those are walleyes that are not really eating. They're just resting. Um, I'm going after walleye that are up feeding and they're up in the weeds. They're up in cover. They're up in structure and they're aggressive and they're every bit of a predator as a northern pike. Um, you know, they've got the big teeth. They've got the streamlined body. They're going to act uh, just like those in the fight is really amazing when they're active like that. So that's what I'm going after is I'm going after those feeding fish. And that's true for basically everything on the fly. I'm not going after the lazy stuff. And I, I think you can, you could go after those deep fish that are sitting on 20 feet uh, on the bottom at 20 feet, um, perhaps with a bugger on a sinking line, just be real patient and get it down, try to catch those, but it's difficult and it would take you out there and it'd be fun. But um, I, I prefer active fish active fishing that's great no i think active fishing is is where where it's at for sure so um and yeah i guess let, let's just stay on the walleye thing for a little bit just to, to you know we're sitting there are we talking you know we're kind of talking reservoir we're talking lakes reservoirs maybe describe the water body because i know there's other areas like you know out here we've got a huge river the columbia river is essentially a reservoir uh, which has walleye um, but but where are you fishing for them out there what, what's the water body look like most of the reservoirs or most of them are reservoirs here. Most of the lakes here are <laughs> reservoirs, I should clarify. Um, they are a, a variety. Of, we have some smaller lakes that maybe top out at 20 feet deep and they've got weeds, uh, weed edges. Uh, and the lake closest to me is um, seven miles long. It gets to 180 feet deep. The shorelines are 45 degree banks with rocks and different transitions. And there's coves with shallow uh, um, shallow flats and it's a variety of things like that. So most of the walleye fishing that I do around here is in these, these smaller lakes, um, 500 acres or less that are, um, fairly shallow, um, in terms of, you know, 20, 30 feet deep max and with decent structure. And I, and I, the stuff that I fish really needs to have defined structure, um, and cover, there needs to be something for me to aim for. I'm not just going to go out and cast an entire lake that's featureless all day, even though you could do that and you can catch them. I want to find spots that are something, and the same thing applies to musky too, is I want to find spots that are going to um, increase my odds at catching them. I want to find spots that hold bait fish or crayfish and focus on those because I know if there's fish feeding, they're going to be in those areas. That's a little bit about the, the lakes around here that I fish. Colorado's got a bunch. 
they manage the CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife manages all these lakes, public lakes and reservoirs, and they stock them and manage them almost as if it was an aquarium. They do sampling every year where they do gill nets and they measure the fish and weigh the fish and count the fish and figure out um, how big of walleye are in there, how many, what's the, um, what's the body mass of the, uh, of the fish in the lake versus um, suckers versus bait fish um, and all the other game fish. And then they'll plant new fish every year based on what they find. And they balance all of this so that um, you get the best fishing out of them as you can. So that's why we have walleye and we have a lot of walleye and we have a, a big um, a group of people that, that love walleye fishing. There's walleye clubs, even in Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, um, there's all sorts of walleye tournaments all over the place. So, and you mentioned, um, you know, obviously we're talking, it give, gives us a little perspective. So you're kind of looking for cover. You're looking for these fish that are maybe coming out for the depths and they're coming in maybe shallower to these places where there's bait fish and they're feeding. So, so take us to the water. So you're there and um, how are you hooking up? Describe that process of actually hooking up with a walleye. What, what do you kind of, what are you using and how, how are you doing it? Well, let me start first with, you got to know the lake. Um, there's a reason guides are good because they really know a lake and they get to know it. You've got to get to know the lake. You can obviously go out there and, and look out and find whatever, but you got to do your homework. You got to do some research. I look at satellite imagery where the water's down to find, um, you know, uh, points or, or, uh, clumps of rocks or, uh, weeds or the outline of like, if, if the water's down 10 feet in a satellite image, I can mark, um, the, outline of where that water is basically marking the main bowl and that I can transfer that to my fish finder. So I have a line going around showing me the main bowl. I know everything inside. So when the water's full, I can go back and realize, okay, that's, that's a break point right there. And I can work inside. Um, I mark things that look green so that there's weeds. And when it's full and I go out there, I do a lot of research first. So I'll go out with my fish finder on the boat um, and go map and mark weeds if there's no bathymetric maps i make my own and i go mark weeds i mark everything interesting that i find plus when i'm over deep water i mark bait fish schools and uh game fish and so when i'm done i can back off that map and i can look okay there's a bunch of weeds here there's a lot of bait fish stacked up in this section of the lake um and i focus my attention then on those areas that look the busiest and most complex and most promising for for walleye and so then I'll go back and what my rig looks like almost on in this is where this might be a little boring because we're not going to get into a bunch of flies or you know, and this stuff. my rig almost always looks like two clousers on like basically one X zero X fluorocarbon level uh, off of a uh, Rio in touch uh, the 24 foot sink tip shooting line sinking line um, and I throw those all day for almost everything. Um, now, the only difference is I'll switch up with buggers if it's more of a crayfish bite. So I'm mostly concerned with bait fish and crayfish. That's what these fish are eating, these walleye are eating. And uh, a lot of the reservoirs I fish have a good population of gizzard shad and rainbow smell. So the clausers are perfect for that. I don't really care a whole lot about the size or the colors, although I experiment. Um, I just was throwing purple and white, the UVs, uh, and that seemed to work. But I can't say that it worked any better than black and white or gray and white or olive and white or black and chartreuse. But I tie all those. I have all those. I go out and I will find – the first thing I'll do is typically fish weeds. And I and I like the wind-blown weeds. So the winds blowing into weeds or brush. I mean, sticks in the spring are fantastic for walleye. The winds blown into this big area of flooded brush – get on the edge of that and just start casting it. You don't really need to be that deep. You can be throwing clousers or some other weighted streamer on a floating line if you want. But those fish will stick up. They'll, they'll set themselves up in there on these edges of the brush. And the brush is easier to see because, you know, if it's sticking out of the water and it's flooded, you can fish the edge of that. It's the same thing with weed beds. If you If you know where the edge of the weed bed is, set yourself up outside of that, cast a little bit into the weeds, and then strip off of them and let your clousers drop. Take a couple strips and keep bringing it back into the boat. But they're they're sitting up there in that cover and ambushing these bait fish that are kind of getting blown in and out of this 
this cover. Um, that's essentially what it looks like. But then there's other times where I'm, there's no weeds and I'm fishing a rocky lake. I'll look for points um, that stick out or what we'd call spines that stick off of a, like a, a main stretch of shoreline. But the points that come out, these humps that appear, um, if you if you boat over, a lot of this depends on sonar. Like you got to have sonar to be effective. You don't have to to catch fish, but for me to be effective and really get to know a lake, I need my sonar. I need my map, and I live off of that stuff. And to fish these points, once you see bait fish around there, and if it's at all windy, they get blown over these. And you see marks on that. You just set up, and I have a, a spot lock on my uh, trolling motor now, which is a godsend. So I'll set up where I can make a good cast over this point and hit spot lock, stay in one spot and just fish that. And I'll, I'll vary my depths, vary my retrieves. That's it in a nutshell, uh, finding And that's mostly in the spring. That's mostly in the spring. And you're, so this lock, so you're saying this motor kind of holds you in one place? Yeah, spot lock. It, you hit a button and it uses GPS to basically hold you in oh, one wow. spot. It's fantastic. It's, I mean, I didn't get it until I had maybe... Last year, I think, my, no, two years ago was my first year with it, and I absolutely love it. So instead of wasting, um, yeah, instead of throwing an anchor down, which takes a lot of work, this thing essentially does the same thing. Well, a lot of times I'll be in, you know, that'll be in 60 feet of water, but I'm fishing to a point that's, um, you know, I'm, I'm casting to a spot that's 10 feet deep, and I'm fishing over 20 feet of water, and then it just drops off. Oh, right. So I'm sitting at 60 feet, so an anchor, anchor never really is an option. No. What I'm doing though is I'm fiddling with the trolling motor all the time to keep myself in one spot. Now I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't know what I did without it. It it totally maximizes your time. Is that a uh, is that like one company that makes that? No, I think they probably all do. They that. all have uh, it. Minnesota, uh, Tarova, I think is what I have, and it's it's a few years old. I, I'm not one to stay on top of technology. I'll ride something until it, yeah. until it fails. In fact, the only reason I got that is because my old trolling motor on the water started smoking, and so I came home and I took it apart and I realized there was some wiring melting. So I put it back together. I rewired it, put it back together, and just started smoking again. I had a, a trip. A guy that went on a trip with me, so I had to take him out the next day. I just went to the store and got this. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah, it's funny how that works. I, 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 uh, I mean, I don't know if it always works that way, but I recently my computer. I talked about this on a, on a past episode, but, um, but yeah, I had to get a new laptop, and uh, and I was like, oh man, you know, had to throw out the money for a new laptop. But I was so glad I did because I didn't realize about my old laptop, even though it was only a few years old, it had really slowed down, and you know, the efficiency, you know, it was just way better. So, anyways, I, I hate to throw stuff away, but. Um, you know, that was you and me both. I, I'm on a new laptop right now. I hadn't had one in eight years. I just never use it, but my wife wants me to travel and get out of the house more. So I'm going <laughs> to do that. So I'm going to take my laptop now. So my wife was in soccer for 20 years. We kind of came here and just did whatever we wanted to do. You know, I mean, it worked out. So she was in soccer for 20 years or something like that. And then so she started this youth soccer club out of the women's semi pro soccer team that she started. And that got big and it was really successful. And then it was um, emerged with a, a, a group out of Denver and they basically started failing. And Amy at that point had been uh, taking her, she was working uh, marketing for the main umbrella group. They merged with the uh, Colorado Rapids group. And then they were like, well, we don't need any mar more marketing people. So Amy was out of her job. She created all this for herself and then worked her way out of a job. So she was in a transition at the coffee shop uh, right around the block from us and didn't really drink coffee much. And the owner was like, well, would you have any interest in taking this shop? And so she bought it and started drinking coffee more. And now that's what we do. So that's my, that's another passion of mine is coffee. I love coffee. So I'm super psyched. We, we've got another, we've got another thing in common. I actually, um, yeah, we have actually one of our sponsors for this show. I love to give a shout out to Angler's, Angler's Coffee. Coffee. Yeah, Angler's Coffee. They're they're amazing. Joe has got a really cool story. I'll put a link to the show notes to that interview with the founder. Um, and uh, but yeah, no coffee. I'm you know I'm pretty much always jacked up on coffee, and and uh, so it keeps me going. But what do, what do you got there? What what do you what are you drinking today? This is actually uh, some beans that my wife just brought back from New York City. She took my uh, my daughter out there. And she just brought a couple bags from some places that she stopped. I don't even know what it is. I didn't bother to look. Um, 
but I have been geeking out on the the roasting process. We don't roast our own beans. We have a local roaster in um, in Boulder, but and I have no intention of doing that either because it's it's just not our thing. Um, they do they do a good roast, and I, I was listening to the podcast you did with English Coffee, and it's fascinating. It's really interesting that stuff, and it's like making wine. It, you know the where you source the beans and how you uh, process them. It's fascinating. Um, it's just not interesting to me to take on at this point that um we do like so i get into the espresso in the grind it's really important to, you know about the grinds um how uh fine you grind it i just got an aero press for camping and that has to be a certain fineness of grind versus the espresso grind versus a drip grind and it's been absolutely a blast like learning more and more about this stuff and that's cool the aero press is it the aero press go Oh, I don't know if it's the go or not. They they just came out with one. We've we've actually had. Um, I've got an episode. We're, we're potentially. I guess I don't want to talk too much in advance, but um, but yeah, I've got. I I, I occasionally go out on these tangents on uh, episodes as well, and sometimes I get flack for it. But I I just love the chats. And we did a uh, podcast with the AeroPress um, uh, marketing uh, person, and we talked because again, I'm trying to put together not only gear. Uh, you know, obviously fly fishing, but sometimes just, you know, there's outdoor gear I think is really cool. So, um, so yeah, I know the whole AeroPress story. Do, do you know that story? Uh, no, I don't. But it's I, really, inter- I'm not going to go into, I'll put a link out to the show notes to that podcast so everybody can hear it. But essentially the guy that created um, the AeroPress is this crazy, like mad scientist inventor guy. And he's really kind of this cool guy. He's got this reputation in there, but he created the, um, <clears throat> what is it? The, this, uh, the Frisbee disc. There's this, you know, that that frisbee that has, has is hollow in the middle. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, the the aerobi. Yeah, he he invented that. So that that was his big. Is that t- what it's called, aerobi, or is that the uh, no. is that the haircutting thing? No, it's aerobi. <laughs> yeah, the aero. I think it is the aerobi, but um, so he invented that, right? It, but his passion is really coffee. So you should, when that comes out, you should listen to that AeroPress uh, interview as well. It's it's good. Anyways, we're 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 way off on on, on a tangent here, Matt. This is great. That um, I, I look forward to seeing that because um, I do the same thing. I'm I, I'm a fishing geek, but I don't really get into um, all the fishing gear. But I love the peripheral gear. I love my AeroPress. Like I was, it's it's the same concept as um, as an espresso machine. So you're using pressure to force water through fine grind, and you can do it. It takes like what uh, 10, 15, 20 seconds or something to push the water through. Um, the, just like our espresso machine uh, at the shop, and it's uh, th- there's nothing special about um, espresso beans, and they're just a mix typically of different kinds of beans to mellow everything out because it's such an intense flavor. You don't want an intense bean flavor to override that, and then it becomes real bitter. So espresso beans are just coffee beans. Like you can make coffee out of espresso beans if it's ground correctly through a drip machine. Um, the AeroPress is basically you're making a shot, two shots of um, espresso, and then you're adding water. You're basically making an Americano, and it's fantastic. I've loved it. So that's cool. I look forward to that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it tastes even better, I feel, than than the Americano because for some reason I never love the Americanos when they make them in the, in the, the stores or whatever. But um, so, well, okay, Matt. So I got one more tangent before we head back to um, our warm water. So your wife, um, I mean, she sounds like she's the badass of the relationship here. She's got, uh, what what'd you say? She was, um, what was the thing, man? She's soccer, like a pro soccer. You're talking about wrangling. I mean, is your wife just this like bigger than life person that, you, you know what I mean? What, what's the story there? Yeah, she's cool. She's um, She's got a lot of good things going for her. Uh, yeah, she is the better half for sure. <laughs> She um, can fly fish. Our first date uh, was at five in the morning on a river uh, in near Ithaca, New York, and um, she got into fly. She went. We went to Skinny Atlas and and bought her a rod at the Orvis shop up there. Like uh, the following week, and from there on, it was you know never looked back. And she is she is great. She was a stud soccer player. Um, was recruited several places and for college and ended up going to Cornell where we met. I was a football player so- or a baseball player. She was a soccer player. We met, we knew mutual friends and then um, hit it off as she was just about to leave her super senior year and, and leave school. We met and then hit it off and moved to Fort Collins eventually. And she started this women's semi-pro soccer team because she was 
uh, met these girls who were really good also. Ended up winning the 90, 1998 National Championship in Miami for this league called the W League, which at the time was the highest level of women's soccer available. And then the pro league started after that. There were several that came and went. Um, none of them took until now. There's the NWSL. Anyway, so that turned into uh, the, uh, the, um, the the soccer club and then and then the coffee shop. Uh, and she's fantastic. Yep. She is, you know how you're a big steelhead fisherman, and I absolutely love steelhead. I got into steelhead in upstate New York, if you can call them steelhead. I still call them steelhead. Um, and Pulaski on the Salmon River and the fly only zone. And I, you know, I was one for 30 or whatever, right? So that's how you talk when you're um, catching steel, one for five, two for seven, you know. She's one for one uh, in Chalice, Idaho, late at night. I was trying to catch, not late at night, it was uh, evening and we had a disposable camera. We never got a picture of it, but she was spotting these fish for me and I couldn't get them to eat. And she's like, let me try. So I climbed up on this hill and was spotting and it was like third cast. She hooked into the steelhead and then landed it. So she's one for one. Hasn't been steelhead fishing since. That's that's amazing. That there you go. Yeah. So so yeah, she's, she's great. so she's 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 got you beat on. It sounds like most things. That's cool. That's always the yeah. way. That's always the way you want it though, because I think you always obviously just like anything, you always want to be surrounded by people that are that are better than you. You know what I mean? Like it's just like business. Absolutely. It's like surround yourself by the people that are actually better than you, and you're going to be good. Um, so back to the so let's take it back to the warm water. So when you're fishing out there, say we talked a little bit about getting a position for these walleye. I mean, is there a potential? Are you just casting and, and you don't even know what you're going to catch? Or are you really focusing on walleye or on bass or on whatever? It depends on the situation. If if you came to me tomorrow and said, Hey, I want to go catch walleye, we'd go out and we'd target walleye. But if you said, Hey, I just want to go out fishing and I want to catch something, then I'd go be I'd be looking for um bait fish and I'd be looking for um these zones that I was talking about before where there's a transition in shoreline or there's a point or there's cover, there's weeds, there's brush, whatever, um, depending on what's in the lake. So if we go to, um, this, this lake that I was at the other day, um, we would go out and fish weed edges. Um, and we, I'd pay attention to the sonar as we're, we're going around this wakeless lake and I'd try to look at side scan and see if I can see bait fish schools and figure out where these, the majority of the fish are going to be. So this lake will have a uh, wiper, which is a uh, palmetto bass, which is a hybrid striped bass, white bass. Um, there's not too many of them, so we probably wouldn't target those. But if we got into them, they're an absolute blast on the fly. <laughs> they're absolute blast no matter how you catch them. Uh, they have what they call the hybrid vigor, and they're just super strong, super vicious fighting fish. Even if they're 14 inches, they just tear you apart. Um this lake would have sauger, which is uh, relative to the walleye. They're just smaller. And they use this lake for producing sogai, which is the hybrid between a walleye and a sauger. And they use that to stock lakes around the state uh, in order to manage bait fish populations or sucker populations because they're predatory and their their lifetime is limited. We can get into that more. But anyway, so we would go out and I'd know the species in this lake. And we would go find um, the places that are most appropriate to catch those. There's a dam. There's rocks along the dam. So you're talking crayfish in that area possibly, but also bait fish. Uh, again, you just got to know the lake. And we would go out and we'd fish weed edges. And there's a lot of them at this lake. So we would go and basically cast our arms off um, along these weed edges and in the weeds and in the brush um, and probably lose some flies doing it. But we that's that would be our approach is we'd go hit – weed beds and then once we did that and we're like this is too hard maybe we caught one or maybe we didn't then we'd go look for carp because that's my fail safe and i know there's carp in the lake and i want to go get something big on the line right yeah and carp are another amazing species that's the that's the cool thing is the more it feels like the more we go into this you know the more you realize like that all these warm water species are pretty cool um well i was just thinking you know I want to take it back before, you know, um, you know, we get too far along to the walleye cause I want to wrap that up. But, uh, John, uh, Gustafson, we have a, a members group, um, that where I usually go out and ask questions and say, Hey, do you have any questions? That sort of thing. And he was really, he's kind of brand new to the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like he's done some trout fishing or whatever, but the warm water kind of steel water lake game is new. So let's just take it back to square one really quick. 
So no, somebody's never done it before. What do you tell somebody if they're like trying to get ready for a trip? You know, just go like rod the gear stuff like. That. I know we musky is different, but if you we're just talking walleye, smallmouth bass, bass, what uh, rod, reel, kind of lines, that sort of stuff could a beginner start thinking about? Well, I'll tell you what I do, and you know this might be better or worse for everybody else, but, um, this is what I do is I fish primarily six weight rods that are fast action. Um, I put a reel on it that is, has decent drag, doesn't need to be anything super special. Um, unless you're going after, you know, something really big, but for me, the, the reel is basically just a line holder. So don't, you know, spend a paycheck on that. Um, just get something that holds line and has a decent drag and you've got a palm so you can use it. Uh, I fish those, uh, what I, described earlier that Rio 24 foot sink, uh, I think it's called the in touch, uh, on almost all this, when I'm fishing those clausers on a sinking line, but I'll also have a floating line rigged up on a six weight primarily for carp, but I'll also throw poppers for smallmouth. So I'll have that rigged up for whatever. Maybe I have a couple of those rigged up. So if I see a carp, if you see a carp and you're out there fishing for something, you want to get on it pretty quick. So I usually have one rod rigged up for carp. Then you got to decide whether you're going to fish crayfish to them, or you're going to fish like a, uh, clooper we were talking about the clooping flies i don't know if you're on that clubhouse chat but so i'll have one set up with a cottonwood seed pattern um but yeah that's it so i just and i listened to your i had picked up a lamson reel the liquid uh, as a as kind of an impulse buy because i was like i need one more reel i'm in a fly shop let me get that it's 100 bucks let me just try it and loved it so i'm like um i need to get more so i got in touch with the lamson guy after listening to your podcast with him oh nice like these guys didn't realize they're in Idaho and it's relatively close. Yep. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to invest in not literally invest. I'm going to invest my, um, <laughs> my fishing expenditures into their stuff. And so I, I, I ended up buying another liquid reel because I have a six, another six weight rod that was not set up with anything. And then I got one of their rods. I got a new eight weight. Um, gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's an eight weight rod. And a uh, Guru S reel for that. And it's absolutely, I just kind of splurged on that one. And I took it out the other day just to test it out. That's going to be my pike musky rod. But um, that thing, it, I took it out for bass and it was fantastic. That anyway, that's the, that, that's the gist of, uh, of the, yeah, of the setup the that I'm using. Yeah. I don't typically go below a six weight for anything on still water, warm water fish. And I'll go up to an eight only if it's really windy or I need to get deeper because the sinking line will get deeper faster. And I do that sometimes in the fall for wiper or schooling fish like white bass out in the middle where I want to find a bait fish school and, and put a cast in over them and let the flies sink down below the school. And the eight weight does that better. Okay. So, so there you go. So basically if somebody's getting going, just your standard six weight, um, like a fast action and then line wise. So basically one heavy sink, kind of a line that gets down there, a dry line. So you're not worrying about, um, like an intermediate line or anything in between. You're, you're more like something to get down, something on the surface. No. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, exactly. I don't go full sink. I have some of those. Um, I just don't care for them. My goal is to get as many casts out as quickly as possible, as far as I can. And this line does it. you know, one, you know, the cast is really important. Um, with this line, it, these also used to be teeny lines. I don't know if teeny lines are still around or not. I think he's, I'm not sure where he's at. He did last time I talked to him, he said he's still putting them out, but I think there's been some challenges, but yeah, he's still around. Right. Yeah. So that's what I started with. Um, the line though, it's, it's awesome because you just, you flip a little bit of line out there. So I've got 20 feet of line out in front of me and then I do a haul and I shoot it behind me. I try to get as much, uh, line shot out of the back cast as I can. So, you know, it's a real powerful. And then I grab it and haul it forward. And, and typically, you know, you can throw out a 60 foot cast pretty quick like that. So it's a quick bang, bang, shoot out 60 feet strip. And we'll, we can talk about the stripping and the presentation a little bit more, but that's the cast and the cast is really important once. And you've got to get that haul because if you don't have the haul going, you're going to whack yourself in the back of the head with a clouser. And I've done it plenty of times at the end of the day, when you're tired, and you forget to haul and you get lazy with your cast and you try to just use your arm to cast, that line gets a little unwieldy. But if you get that haul, you shoot it behind you, let some line out and haul it again going forward, you shoot the rest of it out. Um, if you do it, uh, you get really good at it. And it's very smooth and it's, um, it's just very quick and very long distance. So the, uh, 
the leader I didn't talk about, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, was uh, basically a level leader. And he wanted shorter. So you're not fishing a 9, 10-foot leader taper. I fish basically a 0x or 1x typically um, level off of the fly line. And at, you know, shortest would be three feet, maybe six. start with six feet. Um, and I, I'll do the, uh, the um, you know, what is it called, the, the double surgeon loop with a tag sticking off and I'll tie one clouser off on the tag and and then have a different colored clouser on the back or I'll go clouser um, bugger and sometimes I tie them in line I, I tied a series of clousers that had uh, a wire you know the the bite wire I tied wire loops off the back onto the shank so that I could tie directly in line with that clouser and leave the hook free and so I would tie to that that wire loop in the back of the clouser to run my second clouser. And that worked out pretty well. It's just, I think I got lazy and stopped adding them. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Togan's Fly Shop, providing superior quality products at an affordable price, an amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fly fishing accessories. Togans has you covered when looking for unique in-house products, but also supports and supplies materials and tools from other leading fly brands you know and trust. Togans is now offering their mystery fly tying box where they simplify the process for you in choosing materials. You're only one click away from these hand-picked subscription tying boxes that are packed with value at almost half the cost. And I recently made a order through Togans and the experience was perfect. After a uh, recent trip uh, nipping for trout, I had to replace my tungsten beads and some jig hooks and a few other items. The products arrived in a couple of days from Togans with a nice little card, a bonus value, and a welcome note from the Togans family. Since 2005, Togans has been over-delivering on price and customer service, so it's time to discover for yourself what the buzz is all about. Head over to wetflyswing.com Togans and take a look at their diverse selection of products today. You can support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Togans online. That's wetflyswing.com slash T-O-G-E-N-S. Togans. Now let's get back to the rest of the show. Before we get into the stripping a little bit there on the, you know, how you're doing that. Um, so time-wise, let's just go back to walleye since we've been talking about that. Is there, you mentioned the spring, is there a good time out there to be targeting them or can you can you hit them up throughout the year? You can hit them up throughout the year. They're eating all year round, you know, but it's just harder in the, in, in this time period right now. I just, I mean, I, I went out a week ago and had a great day. Um, the, it depends on the time. And I, I like the new moon period just because it, kind of it helps shorten the window of their their feeding abilities but they do feed well at night so this time of year if you really want to get out and catch them then you should be out um, at dusk and at dawn and as much as you're comfortable getting out there in the dark and fishing um, they can see at night and that's when they do a lot of their feeding but they can also feed during the day and that's what's so surprising to a lot of um, people that like to fish conventional tackle for walleye is that they think bottom bouncers and night crawlers um, they think nighttime fishing and that stuff is all great, but they also get up and feed. It's just, if you and I went out tomorrow and we were like, let's go find some feeding walleye might or might not find them. Yeah. And we might turn to carp and be like, all right, let's go gotcha. fish for carp. And have something. So basically the, the, uh, the, yeah, I mean, springtime, so, it's more temperature. Is that a big factor? Springtime is when they're, they're very active. Um, they're, in, you know, as far as feeding and being in the shallower water, uh, you got pre-spawn, you got spawn, and that's all different based on where you're at and based on moon cycles and stuff like that. Uh, here, it's typically like mid-March or something like that, where you're finding these uh, fish in spawning areas and um, and you can fish shallow for them. But you know, a couple weeks leading up to that, a couple weeks thereafter, it's you know um, there's some really good fishing, and basically all the way into about mid-June, I'd say, here in Colorado, uh, in the lower elevations here on the Front Range is is some of the best walleye fishing and then but you know pick it up back in the fall um october november and i find myself trying to find 12 to 15 foot structure or brush that's on the bottom and fishing that it's much slower uh it's a much slower process but um that's where you know i initially started off talking about a dentry writing this article that's what i was doing i discovered that there were walleye in that range so i just focused on those areas and put my boat in position to 
cast to them. And uh, that was good. So fall fishing can be good. Um, other than that, this time of year, it, you got to really just time it right. And that's being, that's being July, August, you know, uh, that time. So, yeah, so July, August, it'll be um, basically is this this is kind of a temperature thing. Do you want to be getting out there earlier in the day before th- or, or, or is it something else? What's going on there? Yeah, absolutely. Right now, if, if, if we wanted to go walleye fishing, I'd be like, all right, meet me on the water at, uh, you know, 445 in the morning. We'd go out and fish that last bit of darkness and then we'd have the first light and then we'd have, you know, the sun come up and we'd be out fishing that whole period and maybe a couple hours later call it a day. Um, not knowing that maybe later on there's a feeding window and these guys are up just pounding on bait fish. So the other thing I've seen though, this time of year is when the, the shad are, are kind of schooling up closer to the surface and out over deeper water. Um, you know, wiper, white bass, striped bass, they, they ball, they, they ball up this bait fish and they push them to the surface and there's these boils and it's absolutely a blast to fish. The walleye will do that as well. Um, not as, frequently but i was on a lake one time where i thought it had wiper and i thought that these were wiper busting all over the lake it just happened all of a sudden it was an afternoon it was a cloudy day in july and we saw these busting bait fish all over the place and fish moving and and um we went over and we started fishing to them and and we caught them there were walleye doing this and it was just i was just amazed at these fish doing this so you can run into these feeding windows and it's a lot like musky where (laughs) There just happens to be this feeding window and they seem to all just get hungry and go to town. And maybe it's an opportunistic thing for them or maybe it's a cyclical thing or a timing thing or a lighting thing or a barometric pressure thing. Who knows? But it just happens. So if we were going to go catch walleye tomorrow, we'd go in the morning or I'd say, you know, meet me out there at seven o'clock tonight and we'll fish till 11. So that's it. So it's early, early, late. Okay, so that's good. And, uh, and yeah, let's get into, so just quickly, so you make that cast. So say you, you kind of know the zone. It sounds like you're really down these fish and you kind of know, you know, there's some structure, there's some weeds, whatever, and there's bait fish, you're casting your clouser. Um, are you casting to like a certain depth that you know they're at? And then, and then talk about your strip uh, method. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm fishing cover like weeds, it's just, it's about being in that, cover you know and, and around that cover um not necessarily a particular depth uh if i'm fishing points or humps or something like that some other structure the structure being different that it's you know part of the uh, makeup of the structure of the lake um i will then focus on depth more so i'll set myself up so i can cast over this structure and maybe count it down maybe start stripping you don't have to if you're fishing to a fish that's marked in 20 feet of water you don't need to be fishing at 20 feet deep if that's an active feeding fish. You can put that cast out and strip your clousers in pretty quick, and they'll come up 15 feet to eat it if you're five feet deep or three feet deep. Um, they'll come up and eat it. They're used to doing that. 15 feet's nothing for them. That's like length length of my boat is 17. And you look at it, you're like, oh, that's not a very long boat. That's all they have to go. And, and they're shaped uh, well to do that, just like musky. You see musky suspended over 30 feet of water. You don't have to be down 30 feet. You just need to be in know where they are and what you're fishing. So the stripping technique, the, the presentation of these minnow imitations uh, varies. And you just have to experiment every t- single time you go out. If I'm fishing weeds, um, I might fish slower and just do a little tap, tap, tap. Let it sit for a while. Um, I might start stripping back really fast. I always go back to, I have what I call, I have different strips for different, I have a crappie strip and I have a bass, smallmouth bass strip and I have what I call the walleye strip. And it's basically just these six inch, really sharp um, strips in a, just a consistent cadence. For some reason that, you know, after experimenting around, that seems to uh, work well on an ongoing basis. But it just depends on the situation. If I'm fishing to, if I want to be down five to 10 feet deep, I'm going to first count it down a little bit. I'm going to cast over the structure and I'm going to take a few strips and I'm just going to let it sink some more. I'm going to take a few strips. And and these are short little dink, dink, dinks, and then let it sink. And then dink, 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 and let it sink. And they'll they'll hit it while it's sinking and relatively still. Um, That doesn't have to be moving, but they'll also hit a super fast retrieve. You can't keep it away from these guys. If they want it, they're going to come get it. 
So it's just everywhere in between. But the one that I always go back to is that walleye strip where it's just like really sharp six inch strips. Dink, 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 dink. And it's going to come back uh, to the boat, you know, three to four feet deep. Probably if I do that on a, what do I have? A 200 grain um, line, probably my six weight. So yeah, that's it. You know, you're, you're imitating. And so that's for the bait fish imitations for the crayfish imitations. I like to be a little more erratic, uh, a little bit sharper twitches, shorter twitches, more pauses. And especially with smallmouth, like they like that pause. They like that thing dropping. Mm. There you go. Yeah. And, and we probably today won't dig deep into um, smallmouth, although I'm sure there's some people that would that love to hear uh, some tips there on that. So, um, and then what about a, um, so if, uh, you mentioned the clouds are obviously, that's a huge, huge fly. For the crayfish, do you have a name of a pattern we could look up or something that's out there? Yeah, it's called a woolly bugger. Oh. <laughs> W-O-O-L-L-Y. Yeah, the... There's two L's. That's right. Is there two and L's? Why, why is there? Because sometimes it's with one L, right? Yeah, I think it's it's supposed to be two L's. So I just don't want your editors to get all over me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and then uh, yeah, so and sometimes with rubber legs, that's as about as fancy as I get with uh, woolly bugger names. Uh, there are several. You know, when we first started fishing this lake uh, near me, fly shop was like, "You got to try these." The guy who ran the fly shop was big into this smallmouth fly fishing stuff, and he's like, "You got to try these." And it was a uh, olive colored uh woolly bugger with rubber legs yep. and it had a twister tail off the back you know like a rubber twister tail that was his go-to oh, right. so, all right so all right we'll try it that, that worked but then i got into fishing some like lakes up in north park and i got into these uh bright orange and yellow and brown buggers and there's kind of wild looking stuff and i love fishing those just beadhead you know anything you can get that rides hook up is better than hooked down because you're fishing near rocks, lots of rocks, mm. and you want to be down there in those rocks. You want to get them close to the bottom, and you don't want to be getting hung up on everything. That's why clousers work so well, is they ride hook up, and then through weeds they also ride hook up, and so you're you're not getting the twisting motion as much. Catching weeds, you can bring them through weeds pretty good. So yeah. anything that rides hook up, and if you're fishing uh, weeds, obviously you could you could tie in some weed guards or something like that. Do you buy your flies? Is there a place you buy your flies or do you tie all these? I tie all my clousers and I tie a lot of my buggers. Anytime I'm in a uh, fly shop, though, it's like a candy store. If I see some good looking stuff, I got to buy it. Um, I tie all my clousers and I tell you, and I've talked about this before on the, on the clubhouse uh, chat. It's like, I just, I can't, I, I buy all my trout flies because. I can't tie anything with anything less than a rod winding thread anymore because I break it. So I use rod winding thread and I tie my own clousers. I don't like the store-bought clousers. Um, I tie my own. I have some flash in there and I'm a big fan of um, contrast and color. So I tie those. Um, I buy big streamers. I don't tie the big streamers. There's a guy at a local shop that tied up some big musky pike flies and I tried them out and they're awesome. So I just ordered uh, nine more of those in, in uh, some custom colors. So he's going to, they've got weighted heads. I don't really want to bother. I, I'm too busy doing other things, and I don't buy the. Uh, I, I go buy the trout flies um, because I just don't want to tie that anything that small. Buggers, uh, brown and olive. You know, they just they don't have to be. You got to be in the, the thing about these patterns is it's not. There's not a magic pattern. You could be using deceivers. You could be using zonkers. You could be using clousers. Whatever for bait fish imitations. It doesn't really matter about the pattern what matters is that you got to be in the right place you got to have those things and present them in the right place in the right area at the right time and that's really what if you're there i don't think it matters a whole lot what you're using if you can get there you're going to catch fish so you're pretty much uh i mean you've got your fish finder that thing i mean if you're out there without you know obviously somebody could be there without that maybe they're even in a a pontoon boat or a float tube or something i mean could is there a way would you you recommend finding the fish i mean i guess you you're just fishing blind are you ever are you seeing some of these fish like like visually seeing them with my eyes yeah i mean you mentioned there are some things where you're seeing them rise and stuff but i mean how, well just talk how would somebody do it without a fish finder if they're just out there in their tube the only time i'm seeing walleye is when they're busting bait fish which is rare uh and uh, when they're surfacing for mayflies, which I've only seen in Michigan and Canada, 
And that is awesome to catch a walleye and a dry fly, which I did in 95, probably. I think I was visiting a friend in Michigan, Southern Michigan. And, and I was not, you know, I was still really green at fly fishing, but I saw these fish rising and nobody else was fishing. Nobody else was interested. And I saw these fish rising in the evening. I'm like, what are they doing? I noticed there were mayflies on the surface and I didn't know what the fish were. So I just put a cast out off their dock and caught a walleye on a dry fly which was fantastic. And I would love that. We don't have that here in Colorado. We don't have those, what are they, the giant Michigan mayfly? I'm sure there's a more oh, right. technical. Yeah, the green, but that's uh, what, the, the, yeah, the hexagenia is one of the giant mayflies. Yeah, those, those biggest things. And, and they're uh, in Canada also. So the lake trout were rising for those. Uh, one time I was there and I didn't have a setup for that. But um, that's the only time I'm visually seeing walleye. I don't really see them in the shallows or sight fishing. If you don't have a fish finder, a fish finder to me is like a phone. Like you can't leave your phone. You got to have it. So you're saying you. So you're saying you got to have a fish finder. That's 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 like a gear. If you're going for walleye or whatever, you should have one of those. Saying that you have to have one is, um, yeah, it's a little strong. Like you don't have to have a cell phone. No, you know that. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> If, if you want to be productive and, and part of society, then you probably should have one and use it. What about a boat? What about a, uh, uh, what, what's your boat of choice you're using out there? So I got a Boston Whaler Montauk. It's a 1986, 17 foot. Um, so this is like a, this is a, a boat. This is like a full on, um, uh, not a flat bottom boat. It's got a little bit of a V. It's a center console. It's a little bit closer uh, to a flats boat, but it's not a flats boat. Um it is a uh, it's a perfect size boat for Colorado and what I need. Um, if I replace it, I'd probably replace it with some sort of skiff so I could do more pulling around for carp. But this thing, it works fine. It's great. I bought it in 2003, and that was actually what led to the formation of Fish Explorers because I wanted to go looking for tiger muskie. I wanted to go look for wiper. I didn't know where they were. I didn't know where I could put my boat. There was no list saying, hey, here's where you can put a power boat. So I, I started digging into that and then cross-referencing it and all that stuff. And that's what led to Fish Explorer. And that's really the beauty of that. But um, the boat, let me uh, just, to get out for walleye, you don't have to have a boat. There's plenty of people that catch walleye on the shore. If you're night fishing from a dam, I mean, that's like if you have walleye in a lake and there's a dam that you can walk along at night and fish, that's probably your best opportunity to catch something from shore. Um, if you have access to a lake during the day and you can, you can reach points and humps and stuff like that, perfectly accessible. Float tubes are great because, you, you know, in, in pontoons, you don't need to be moving a whole lot if you know the area. Um, sonar, fish finders, that technology, 100% highly recommended in order to do any kind of warm water fly fishing. I live off it. Um, sometimes I hate to admit that, but just to get to know a lake, um, you, I mean, when you look out at it, it's flat. You don't realize there's a whole bunch of stuff going on underneath. You need to figure out what's going on under, un, underneath. You need to be able to picture it in your mind, what's going on, where these points are, where the weeds are. You need to be able to mark that so you know you're 50 feet from a weed edge and you can cast into it, that kind of stuff. It's If you want to be successful um, time and time again, catching warm water fish, especially walleye on the fly, sonar is really, really big. Yeah. So, okay. So that's good. And, and let's just touch, you know, fish explorer before we get out of here, I wanted to hit on this because, um, you know, this is a project you've been working on and it sounds like maybe it's focused around Colorado and a few States. So there's probably a lot of people that are listening where maybe they won't, this won't help them at least right now, but describe uh, fish explorer. Like what does it do and who, who's it for? Well, we, yeah, so we're in several States, uh, five States, um, but, and we're working on another one right now. Uh, most of those states are not very active. Primarily, we're focused on Colorado. Wyoming is slightly active. What we did, so I got the boat I mentioned. I, I was looking for tiger muskie and wipers. So I got some stocking data from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, big spreadsheet of information. And I was looking for places that I could take my motorboat with a boat ramp and launch it. And there was no list saying, here's where you can take a motorboat. Um, so it just took research. I had to go. There's several jurisdictions that manage these bodies of water around the state. So I just had to figure out who that was, make phone calls, do some research on the internet, put that together. And I, Google Maps API had just come out. So I'm like, man, it would be cool if I could just plot all these lakes on a map and then say, I want to catch walleye and flip it. So it would just show the walleye lakes. Um, that's the 
that's how Fish Explorer started. And so I'm a web developer. I was able to develop the core of Fish Explorer to do that. So if I want to find tiger muskie, flip a button, say tiger muskie, and it pops up the lakes of tiger muskie stocked in them. It took a little more research than that, though, because if you stock a certain fish in a, in a body of water 10 years ago, is it still alive or, or did they succeed? You don't know. So we had to talk to all the biologists and we and we do this on a regular basis. Uh, and we now, I think, have... Um, Boy, it's 600 and some bodies of water, uh, still water, lakes, reservoirs, ponds in Colorado. And keeping up on all these lakes is the real trick. And it's been 15 years since we launched, um, but it is a project that nobody else was doing. There's no real model uh, to go off of. And to me, it was, it was a passion project, and I just decided to develop it. And it's just going through an ongoing refinement process. And at some point we'll be like, okay, this is how this is working really good now. Let's let's go ahead and add some other states. But right now it's primarily focused on Colorado, and we have a hundred and some what we call skippers. They're in charge of a particular body of water, and then we have regional editors, uh, ten of them, that focus on just a smaller section of the state. And we do what we do is we try to keep the conditions up to date for every body of water that we can. And that's primarily water temperatures, water levels, and any other observable conditions. We try not to focus on fishing information because that's a sensitive topic. Most people don't want to share what they were catching and where they were catching them, that stuff, which is perfect. I want to know water temperature. I want to know water level. Can I get my boat in, basically? And what kind of season is that lake in right now. So is it 75 degrees, 65 degrees, 80 degrees? Based on what I'm going after, I can use that information to apply when I go to that lake. That I, yeah, I can get my boat in. Here's a list of species that have been confirmed are in that lake. And here's the water temperature. Here's the season that they're in. Then I go and I can figure it out. That's really my enjoyment of the sport is figuring things out. It's not necessarily catching fish, although that's the whole goal. I love figuring things out like a puzzle. That's Fish Explorer in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot of other things surrounding it, you know, write blogs and whatever. Um, but the core of it is the core of it is the are the lakes and and maintaining the information on those lakes. Gotcha. So so like we said, so if somebody's in Colorado or heading there, you know, we talked about getting ready for walleye. And if they were gonna focus on walleye, they go to fishexplorer.com right now and just um I mean, what they could say, I'm going to be in near Fort Collins and it'll pop up a, a lake. Uh, I mean, how would they know where, like, say they don't know any of the lakes. They, they have no, no, they're just coming through Colorado. They want to fish a lake. Could they go on to there and actually find a good spot that has walleye? Yeah. A good lake that has walleye, not necessarily a spot. Yeah. Or a, yeah. A lake. Yeah. They could just type in wall or how would they do that? Would they type that in the search and then that would pop up all the walleye lakes or something like that? Uh, first of all, you're going to get limited information just as a, like a you know a free visitor on the thing. We we have a subscription model which basically exposes everything um, to you know everything that we have is 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 given out to subscribers, and then there's like an intermediary level where you sign up for a free account and you get access to certain information, and so you can find stuff that way. But it's like seven bucks a month. Um, you can do one month cancel. So if you're coming through town, there's not much to to pay and then and you can yeah you pull up a map and go i want to find wiper um and here's all the lakes that we have that uh, you know we know have wiper you know um we have high country lakes we have front range lakes it's basically from every corner of the state um throughout and we also have rivers we just don't do a whole lot to me rivers are a lot easier than a lake to figure out so you got a lake you look at it it's flat you don't know what's going on you don't know what's in there rivers here you know they're going to have trout um if the flows are good you can fish it. If the water temperature is right, you can fish it. And finding the fish to me in rivers is a lot easier. Uh, you know, a lot, you know, you can see the, the currents and you can see the seams, you can see the pockets, um, you can see the boulders, that kind of stuff. Um, so there is a river piece to the website. And the way I designed that was if you know the minimum flow that's good for fishing in that river section and the maximum flow, let's get the current flow data and then color code that section on a map based on whether it's too high too low or, or you know in the sweet spot and so you can get a kind of color coded snapshot of the rivers that we cover in the state and see which ones are too high which ones are too low and which ones are flowing good 
Gotcha. Okay, perfect. So we'll have a link out to that. And that's probably the best place for people to connect with you. Um, as we take it out of here, the, the 222 is a little segment where we usually do when we can uh, top tips, tools, resources. And let's just take it out, you know, again, uh, focusing on walleye. So I think we have the flies, we've got the woolly bugger and the clouser. Um, what about a couple of tips? Say somebody's out there now, they're on a lake, they're fishing, they feel like maybe they're in the range of some walleye. What, what sort of t- tips would you help them uh, give them to help them find a fish or catch a fish? Well, first of all, find the structure, find where they're going to be feeding. Yep. They need to be feeding. Like You don't want to go after the lazy fish that are just hanging out in the bottom. Um to find where those active fish are, find those, find the cover, find the structure. That's a, a big deal. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Um, you could flail around the entire lake, um, which is fine. Go, you know, go for it. You, you'll end up catching fish. But if you want to increase your chances, go find the cover, and then and go find the structure, which is usually on the uh, margins of the lake. Yeah. Um, the second tip would be consider bait fish structure. So balls of bait fish, consider the structure. So if you see, if you're over deep water and you see balls of bait fish, um, especially on your sonar, and you see game fish associated with that ball of fish, fish it as if you would a weeds. You know, like you don't have to be, if, if that bait fish school is set up at 20 feet deep, uh, it's a big ball and you see game fish around there, you don't need to be down 20 feet deep. You can be. It's actually good to try to get in fish below a bait fish school. Um, but in that case, you know, put a cast and focus on staying five feet down and strip across it and see if something comes up and eats it. That's a good thing. So that's another technique. If you can't find them in structure on shoreline or structure that's more accessible depth wise, then if you find bait fish schools, consider that structure also. There you go. Cover. There you go. Perfect. What about, um, a couple of resources? So, you know, we mentioned fish explorer, but if there is, you know, something else out there, is there something that's maybe not your own that you would direct somebody to, to figure out get some more information on this man there's several things um none of them are uh, gonna be resources for fishing walleye on a, on a fly rod sure but the thing is is the first resource are conventional tackle fishermen yep uh, when i started fish explorer i thought everybody was uh, a fly fisherman in colorado and it turns out like 90 percent of the people are more conventional tackle oh here. nice and i love these guys are great fishermen um and it, there's it whether they're fishing um, bait or um, like spin gear, eerie dearies or trolling crankbaits or whatever, they have an intimate knowledge of the water that they're fishing and what those fish are doing seasonally. And um, it's great to learn from people who have figured this stuff out on a particular body of water. So that's your number one resource is anybody that's familiar with the body of water and the fish that you're going after. Um, and then emulate that with a fly rod. So what we're doing is we're imitating bait fish. That's their main food source. And um, you need to basically put your flies where the fish are feeding. And that's the, that's the game. Um, yeah. That's a big resource. Um, the other resources that I use a lot are, um, you know, satellite imagery. Like I talked about before, oh, to, yeah. you got to learn, you got to learn the lake. You got to learn the topography under the, under the water surface and satellite imagery uh, does a lot of that, uh, bathymetric maps. Um, so like insight Genesis, uh, C map insight Genesis is a Lawrence product and it's a, you can go on there and, and find all sorts of, um, bath maps that are people, uh, recording their own data and uploading it. Hmm. And it starts creating these bath maps of lakes that might be around you. And you can use that to find, you know, where the deep water is and where it meets shallower water, where it meets points and that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of stuff you, you're looking for. You really, uh, yeah, you really need to focus on, on, on those spots and bath maps, satellite imagery, those things are your friends. Perfect. Is satellite imagery, are we talking like Google? Uh, yeah, Google Earth. Yeah, Google Earth, yeah. Go to, go to Google Earth and use the time tool. Um, up at the top, there's a little clock, right? And, and I don't know if you've done this before, but you can go back in time pull up a river or I mean a, a lake and look at it full the most recent. And then you can just step back in time, see if there's one where it was drawn down, which happens in Colorado all the time. So you can go look and analyze pretty good, depending on how old the satellite image is. Um, a lot of these lakes, you can go find stuff on shoreline, um, which brings me to another point. If the lake is drawn down, go take a walk at the lake. You know, So if you're there and it's 10 feet low and it's normally full in the spring, 
go walk around and, and take notice of everything that will be submerged in the spring. And you can get a really good look at, at what these fish are doing when the water's full. Perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge tip, uh, Matt. Good stuff. You know, I, there's, you know, many times on this, you know, like I said, there's a bunch of species, but I think we kept it fairly general um, as far as the stuff we talked about could probably apply to small, would you say it can apply to smallmouth bass and other lake fish pretty, pretty easily? Yeah, I use the same setups for smallmouth. I just fish them a little bit differently. I use the same setup for wipers and white bass, um, but the approach to finding them is a little bit different. And tiger musky and musky, I'd say the musky are probably more similar to walleye in that I'm I'm really focused on structure um, and cover for musky. Um, pike as well. I don't do as much pike fishing just because there's not it's not great around me. And then when I'm up in Canada, I, I don't want to like they're a nuisance. So I go strictly for musky. Um, but yeah, it's the same setup, same flies, basically for all that stuff. And that's where it gets a little boring. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like I'm not going to rattle off these secret flies for you. <laughs> it's more about learning that, learning the water and, and learning the presentation. No, I think it's great. I think that's part of this. The, part of the game is, you know, fishing, fly fishing, whatever. It's like self-exploration, right? You're out there. You got to. You know, that's why it's fun. You know, we're not going to be able to tell everybody the exact step by step to doing it, but it's more like giving people a head start on it or help them a little bit. Um, I did, Matt, before we get out of here, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about one thing, and this maybe I, I think is a, a little uh, deep personal, and I ask it because I think it's... Um, I think it's powerful for inspiration for me. I think about, I recently had a guest on who talked about his dad dying, you know, passing away and it was really pretty powerful. But you, I know you, you mentioned, I guess off air, like you had a brain tumor. Is that something you could talk about? Like just to give us some perspective on, you know, what you went through and what you take away from that? Because I can imagine that, you know, your life probably, you probably look at life differently than some people, right? We get stuck in our daily thing, like having, you know, not thinking about what's important, but can you uh, shed some insight on that? Yeah. I mean, it was a, definitely a life changer. Uh, not, a, you know, not in a drastic way, but just in my approach, I highly recommend everybody have a major event like this at some point, because it makes you step back and go, Hmm, you know, what's really important. And it's just like the pandemic we went through. You, you, everybody had their blinders on and they're going forward day to day life. And then you have this pandemic, which makes you step back. And a lot of people realize that, no, I, I need to do this more often. I need to go fishing more often, or I need to get away. I need to take life less seriously and and, and really focus on the things that are, you know, that make me happy. And in an event like this, I'm fine now. I just have, I don't have hearing in one ear. That's kind of a pain in the butt. But other than that, my balance is a little messed up because they took that ear out. The ear basically was a tumor. So like I took that ear out where it goes into the brain. Um, so I'm fine now, but at the time it was really scary. The interesting thing about that story was, I had never had surgery in my life. Very healthy. You know, I've had some sports injur injuries. That's about it. I ended up going to Canada muskie fishing that September. And while I was there, I got this intense stomach pain. And I it still went out fishing, but I was really in pain. And, and one night I was just curled up in the bathroom all, in the bathroom all night. And um, I, flew, I, I got a ride back on a boat uh, to the landing. I took an hour and a half cab ride on this bumpy road, just laying in the backseat of this taxi. And got on the flight and almost missed my connecting flight, got home and my wife picked me up and we went, to, I went to bed and next morning she's like waking me up, pushing me. She's like, we need to go to the emergency room. That was my appendix had ruptured oh. in Canada. And I didn't know, like I, I thought it maybe was that, but it wasn't like this, like just get me out of here kind of thing. It was like really painful, but I could deal with it. So I got to the hospital and they did the appendix thing. So this was like, um, this was October, early October. And, um, I had met my deductible on the insurance and stuff. So then I, I woke up one day and I, it was like a month later and I had this um, vertigo and I, I, was, I really like, I got sick. I got physically sick and I couldn't walk anywhere. And I was the only one home and I called, I was supposed to be at some event. I called my wife. I'm like, I can't, I can't come. I'm sick. It was just out of nowhere. Um, and that, then I went through a, a process of things going to see ENTs and, and they were, they put me through all these tests. So you have Meniere's, you have these stones in your ear or whatever. And then, one of them mentioned weeks later, he's like, well, you might want to get an MRI because there's yeah, maybe a chance to, you get, I'm like, well, it's free. I've got my, my, my deductible. So they were giving me shots in the ear at that point of steroids, like in my eardrum. And um, I went in for the second shot. He's like, you've got a tumor. So we had to get all this in by the end of the year to fit into the deductible. And 
we were able to do it. And got December 29th, they drilled a hole in my head, took the tumor out, said, you're not going to be able to hear out of that ear again. You're going to have the balance will come back, but it'll, you know, it'll, it'll get better. It just won't be a hundred percent. So yeah, uh, you know, recovering from that was ridiculous. Um, it was several months um, just being kind of in the zone of this is all I'm doing right now. And that's, you know, and it made me think, I thought a lot about uh, fish exploring, about where it's going, what it is, and what's it going to be, and um, about, uh, you know, friends and family. And, and uh, it's just maybe kind of step back and look at things a little bit differently. It was a nice reset period. I, I wish, like, the, I didn't have to go through that to have a little reset period. But um, it's it, it was kind of nice in that way. And like I said, everything's fine now. So this just happened. So basically this last December you had the surgery and all that this last year. No, it was five years ago. Oh, this is five years ago. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Five years ago this December. Yeah. This December. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's, it's been, been a long time, but yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Been, so it was, yeah. No, thanks for asking. No, I don't mind sharing that. It's, oh, good. Yeah. No, it, I think it just, uh, for me, it's a little bit, again, yeah, like you said, it kind of puts things in per- perspective and makes us appre- appreciate like when you're sitting there working so much and maybe not fishing as much to be like, you know what? I mean, life can be short, <laughs> you know, we don't, none of us know when it's going to end. And, uh, and I think, I think it, hopefully that inspires people to today, maybe get out, you know, get out on the water. i we're doing a road trip here next week or so or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's kind of getting the kids out. That's a big thing for me is to get them exploring. And we're talking about maybe going down to South America and the same sort of thing. It's like, what can I do for my kids to, to help show them? some of the cool stuff in the world and um how old are they uh they're seven and nine. Seven nine. Oh, that's great because they're very functional they can do a lot of stuff yeah that's good my kids are older than that but the one thing i one takeaway i just wanted to mention yeah. from that episode of uh going through the brain t- it was uh benign so it's like you know they just take it out and boom you're you're good to go and i have friends and our neighbor's uh, son is going through uh brain cancer right now and that's that's a bad deal and i know i got away um, even though it was tough to go through, it's, it was not a death sentence. It was not anything really, um, terribly serious besides removing something bad out of my head. And I just, you know, I see a lot of people that are really, really pretty serious about fishing. I'm like, you know, it's not that it shouldn't be serious. The point of, for most people would be to enjoy fishing. And I love seeing these photographs of people that are really enjoying themselves and really, like got a huge smile, you know, and they're just so impressed with what they just caught and they're so happy with the moment versus, you know, a lot of photographs of people just not smiling or hiding behind the fish. Like I'm a badass. Right. Look at me, what I can catch. And at some point you just, you have to just enjoy the the fishing and that's, that's right. Don't lose that. That's, I don't think I ever lost it. Like I still enjoy it. I do catch myself every once in a while taking a fishing trip too seriously. I'm like, I, I need to appreciate this more, but Man, if, if if you learn anything from me about my episode of going through that surgery was it, when you're out fishing and you obviously really enjoy fishing because you're listening to this, make sure to enjoy it and really enjoy it. And then show that in some photographs because <laughs> I'm getting tired of all the, I'm getting tired of all the stern face uh, photographs I'm seeing like in social media and stuff. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you wonder sometimes if those people are actually how much fun they're having or. I guess everybody's got a different thing going on, but uh, cool, Matt. So I'll, I'll send everybody out to uh, fishexplorer.com if they have questions for you or want to connect. Yeah, you can reach me through the bio page on our About Us. Um, you'll see me up there as the executive editor. Okay. Um, you can click through that and you can, uh, that'll, that'll send me an email. Good. Good. Okay, cool. Well, I, thanks for taking the time today. And uh, we'll definitely, you know, we, we obviously touched on walleye, but I think, like we said, a lot of this can apply. And uh, definitely appreciate you uh, sharing, you know, the tips and tricks. And we'll, we'll keep in touch with you as we move forward. Yeah, it sounds great. Keep up the good work, man. This is a really good podcast. I enjoy listening to it. I know you do a, a lot of episodes, a lot more than I would expect you to do. And I know it takes a ton of work. So keep up the good work because this is really fascinating stuff. I love uh, listening to some of these people that you've got on. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links and everything else we covered today. Just head over to wetflyswing.com slash 245. That's 245. 
If you found this podcast helpful, please share it on Facebook and leave a five-star review on your app of choice. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash love, L-O-V-E, and that'll give you a quick way to uh, leave that review. There's uh, some links out to the popular apps. That is it. That is a wrap for today. I'm uh, looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you online or maybe on the water. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.